Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to St Paul's Cathedral. It's very good to see you all, and welcome to the Sunday Forum, which we hold on the first Sunday of every month, and at which we hear from the author of a recently published work of theology, and then have, as relaxed as possible, uh, a conversation about that book, about what the author has said to us, and about some of the uh, concepts that arise from the book. And then afterwards, there's an opportunity to meet uh, our guest, and indeed to purchase the book itself. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome today Paula Gooder, who's going to talk about her new book on heaven, uh, a theology of heaven in which we're challenged to think differently about concepts of heaven, not so much as the place we go to when we die, as the ultimate dwelling place of God. Paula is a distinguished biblical scholar. She lectures at King's College London and at Birmingham University, and she's also canon theologian of several cathedrals, I think Birmingham, Guildford, and Salisbury. Uh, so it, we're very pleased indeed uh, to have her with us today. This isn't her only book. Uh, other works, The Meaning is in the Waiting, The Spirit of Advent, and This Risen Existence, The Spirit of Easter. So today we invite Paula to talk to us about her book, Heaven. Thank you very much indeed, Paula. I always intended to say that I was very pleased to be here but I am especially pleased to be here today because I so very nearly wasn't on all sorts of different levels. Um, yesterday the train lines went down from between Birmingham and London and um, this morning I discovered that um, a fact that I ought to have known, that it's Eid today, which means that 99% of taxi drivers in Birmingham weren't driving taxis, which meant that I arrived at Birmingham New Street at 9.28 for my 9.30 train, which was the only train that would have got me here on time. So I've had a slightly stressful morning, and I'm utterly delighted to be here with you. And very pleased to be given the opportunity to talk to you about my new book, Heaven. It is the book that I've written that lies closest to my heart because it contains all sorts of theology about which I am deeply passionate and which I want to try and encourage people within the Christian tradition to begin to talk about much more than they do normally. And it may seem to sound a little odd for me to say that because the word heaven is, of course, enormously well used, not only within the Christian tradition, but outside of the Christian tradition. Just say the word heaven to pretty much anybody, and most people will have some kind of concept of something that they would like to talk about, whether it's something that they believe about heaven or something that they don't believe about heaven, something that they believe that somebody else thinks about heaven, which is utterly bonkers, um, or all sorts of different things. And for me, one of the very interesting things about writing this book is um, I'm quite used to being deathly boring in describing what I'm doing. Um, so I'll go to the school on the school run to pick up my children from school, and somebody will say to me the dreaded question, so what have you been doing today? And, um, you know, for example, when I was writing my book on New Testament interpretation, that exact question came to me when I was in the middle of my chapter on post-structuralist criticism. Um, and uh, had to decide whether to lie or not. Um, but when I was writing my book on heaven, and someone said to me, what have you been doing today? What was really interesting was the minute I told them, everyone was interested. Everyone wanted to talk about it, to explore the ideas, and to think more deeply about the idea of heaven. So on one level, the idea of heaven is enormously popular. It's something that many, many people think about and many, many people have an idea of. And that is as true outside of the churches as inside of the churches. But what is very interesting is if you compare popular views of heaven with the texts within the Bible, then you discover a very, very interesting mismatch going on. If you can summarise the popular view of heaven, you know, the kind of conversation you would have normally in the street with someone about heaven, then by and large you could boil it down to the place where I go when I die. And quite possibly the place where you will go when you die. Not so sure about him over there, but definitely we're all right about going to heaven. But if you compare that with the biblical narratives, then something very, very interesting happens. <laughs> 
it is very, very difficult to map that popular idea of the place where I go when I die immediately onto the biblical language of heaven. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it is just a lot harder than you would imagine given the popularity of the idea. So that gets us into the whole question of if it's hard to do and you read the biblical narratives, does that mean that they don't really talk about heaven? Well, of course, the answer to that is no, of course, they do talk about heaven. And heaven is a very, very important strand throughout the biblical narratives. But what is interesting is that heaven in the biblical narratives is not solely and most definitely not primarily about what happens to me when I die. If you read your way through the biblical narratives, the thing that heaven refers to 90% of the time throughout the biblical texts is the place where God dwells now, not the place where I will go when I die. So what we've done, very interestingly, is privatised and postponed heaven. We've made it about me then, rather than about God now. And when you begin to re-change that around, you begin to get a very interesting perspective on heaven. So that's the first thing to bear in mind, is that we have privatised and postponed it, made it about me when I die, rather than about God engaging with the world now. The second thing that we have done, which is the slightly more complex one, and one which we need to address a bit more in more detail, is that we've made heaven a spiritual place place that is not physical, it is not um, concrete in any way, it's not spatial, it is a spiritual dwelling. Um, and one of the really very intriguing questions in terms of popular ideology is where is heaven? Now, what you've got there then is another very, very interesting mismatch. Because if I said to you, where is heaven? My hunch is that most of you would point upwards. And then if I said to you, do you really think it's there? You would say, oh, no, 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 of course not. And what you've got, therefore, is this very, very fascinating popular image, which actually many people don't really hold when you press them to it. And the fascinating question then is where does that come from and what does that mean about our understandings about heaven? So let's spend a moment reflecting on where that comes from and why it becomes important. If you look into the biblical narratives, then it is very clear that the vast majority of the biblical writers, if not all of them, are functioning with a certain cosmology, a certain way of viewing the world, which has, largely speaking, the world as a flat plane, um, which is surrounded by a dome. If you know your authorised version, you'll know that that's called the firmament. Um, interestingly enough, modern translations have tried not to translate it as the firmament because it doesn't mean anything. Um, the question, therefore, is how do you kind of put it into any kind of English? If you're interested, um, this is a bit of a side point, but it is, I think, a very interesting side point. The, the translators of the authorised version of the King German, James Version um, used the word firmament because they couldn't work out how to translate it. And um, this word is translating the word, the Hebrew word rakia, which means something which is beaten out very thin. And so when the King James translators were trying to think of a word, um, they kind of fumbled around and couldn't really find a good English translation. So what they did was nick the Latin word firmamentum. And the Latin word firmamentum literally translates the Hebrew word rakia. So, the word firmament doesn't mean a lot today because it never really did mean anything in English. It's a Latin word that has been brought in for a concept we don't really have. So whatever you want to call this, um, there's this over the world. And then above that is the place where God dwells. And it is very clear as you work your way through the biblical narratives, if you have a look in Genesis, if you look in Psalms and Isaiah, onwards into the New Testament texts, that the vast majority of the biblical writers still think of a world that looks like this with heaven just there, just above the earth. It is spatial like earth is. It is created like earth is. And therefore, most of the biblical authors have this very strong idea of heaven as a spatial created existence which lives just above earth. Um, in the same kind of realm as Earth does. And another very interesting thing to observe from the biblical narratives 
And this is something which I think comes as a surprise to a lot of us who think in terms of the more popular Christian tradition view of um, heaven, is that it is, seems to be very clear in the biblical texts that heaven is not eternal. Let me give you some evidence for heaven not being eternal. In Genesis 1 verse 1, um, a verse which many people will know, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The implication there being that heaven did not exist before God created it in Genesis 1. Go flick to the end of your Bibles, to Revelation 21, and there you have the promise of a new heaven and a new earth, which if you add it into various passages like those you get from Matthew's Gospel, heaven and earth will pass away, it becomes very clear that actually heaven can't be eternal because it was created at the same time as earth was, will pass away at the same time as earth will, and will be replaced in the same way that earth will be. So heaven, therefore, is not an eternal realm far, far away from earth. Heaven is a spatial created realm, realm very, very close to earth, created to be alongside earth. As a result, therefore, back to my question, if I said to you, where is heaven, you would point upwards because you are well trained in the biblical thought world that says this is where heaven is. But you wouldn't really think that because you don't share the cosmology anymore. And that is where we get into what is, for me, a really very interesting question of how do we, as modern 21st century Christians, engage with a biblical thought world which in many, many ways we no longer share? How do we actually begin to process the fact that we now live in a world which is conceived very, very differently than the world in which they functioned? Now, I would argue, and I argue in the book, that one of the things that we have ended up doing is firstly actually avoiding the topic. Um, it is not often that you actually get into a detailed and thoughtful exploration of what you do in terms of Hebrew cosmology when we don't share cosmology anymore. And I'm always entertained, particularly at Christmas time and Advent, which we're about to hit, where we sing all of these hymns about direction. You know, lo, he comes with clouds descending, implication being he's up and then he's coming down. And we sing the hymns, we read the Bible passages, we sit in beautiful church buildings which are depicting up and down all over the place. And then we say not a thing about it. We don't mention that there is a problem because I think one of the things is that we become very uncomfortable with the fact that our world and the biblical world doesn't really match anymore. So we leave it on one side. That's one thing that we do. The other thing that we do, as I've said already, is that we make heaven into a spiritual realm. It's kind of up because spirit stuff is up, but it's not really physical, it's not really created, it's not really spatial. It is a different kind of world. And one of the things that I think that we need to do is actually to stop avoiding the subject and stop shoveling it off into being just, and I don't, and I don't mean that pejoratively, but just a spiritual idea, and instead begin to start a deep and thoughtful conversation about how we, with our modern cosmology, can begin to think thoughtfully and creatively about a heaven which fits into our world. And one of my suggestions is that actually we now have the language and the thought patterns that allows us to begin to engage creatively again with the idea of heaven, courtesy of science fiction, which for me is a really very interesting thing. Think Doctor Who. Think Philip Pullman, if you can bear to, um, with the idea of the parallel universes side by side. Think The Matrix. Think all sorts of different film and television um, pieces of work that have gone on over the few, past few years, which talk about worlds which are spatial and created and physical, which are cheek by jowl with ours, but which we cannot see. And once you begin to engage with that thought pattern, then actually we begin to have language that we can start reinvesting the language of heaven with. We can start talking seriously about heaven again, I would argue. Because what that means, therefore, is that if we can start talking about a heaven which is spatial and created and right next to earth, then heaven stops becoming an irrelevant, airy-fairy spiritual idea 
and starts becoming a realm in which God dwells right next to humanity, because that's the place where God loves to be. God created heaven to be right next to earth so that God could be as close to the human beings he created as he could manage to be. God is so close to us with the thinnest veil separating us from God that sometimes heaven breaks into earth and we still have that kind of language. But if we can start talking and reinvesting our language with the ability to talk about heaven as the biblical writers did, but just in a different cosmology, then we begin to have a much deeper and much more profound theology that we can begin to explore. So I would argue that a theology of heaven, of heaven is essential for understanding the Bible, it's all the way through the biblical narratives, but it's also essential for understanding the world in which we live now. For me, the question that I hear resonating in different ways um, around the world in which we live is, surely this isn't, this isn't all it, it, there is. Surely this world is not the only experience that I will ever have. And I would argue that a biblical theology of heaven is the direct answer to that question. No, this world is not all there is. This is not the only reality in which you can encounter existence. There is another reality, a reality that is ruled over by the principles of God and not the principles of humanity, a reality in which there is justice and righteousness and compassion and love and peace and not the conflict and discord and injustice that we encounter in the world in which we live. And when you can start beginning to talk about a theology of heaven, which has a rich language of resonance of the world in which we live, then you begin to realize that actually heaven is not just something far off that might affect me at some point when I meet my own demise. And actually, heaven is something that affects who I am now and the way in which I live my life in the world now. So that's my first big point, and it's much bigger than the second point, so I wanted to kind of go on about it for longer, that actually our understanding of heaven, our understanding of the way in which we live in the world, needs to be reinvigorated by a more thoughtful and more thought out theology which fits with our cosmology. It simply doesn't do to point upwards and say, we kind of think heaven's there, but we're not really very sure, now let's talk about something else. For me, what we need to begin to do is to reinvest our language with a, a theology of heaven which works today and begins to resonate with what the questions that people are asking. So, of course, that's the first issue. But there is, of course, a second issue, which I, is a very, very big one, and I'm sure you're going to want to ask lots of questions about it. But let me just kind of put it in as the plug to the other side. If we say that heaven is about where I am going to go when I die, and then if we say that the Bible isn't primarily about where I go when I die, the obvious question is, so what therefore does the Bible say about where I go when I die? You can see it's kind of a big question, um, which we're just going to kind of glance around for a moment. And one of the very interesting things to observe, if you go through the biblical narratives, is that um, for the vast majority of the Old Testament period, it was not a question that was asked. Whether there was much of an answer given is disputable, but as a question of where I go when I die, you are hard pressed within the biblical narratives to find much of that as a discussion at all. The time where it begins to arise is in the book of Daniel, where you begin to have an understanding of what will happen after death. But it is worth noting that there is a very strong strand which runs into the New Testament period of Jewish belief which never did believe in life after death. And we need to kind of hold that as a strand, that there's a very strong tradition which you find represented by the Sadducees, but not solely by the Sadducees, that didn't believe that anything happened after death. So one answer to what will happen to me after I die from the biblical narrative is not a thing. Um, but obviously there is more to say than that. So let me get on to the more now. If you trace the strand through the Gospels and through the writings of Paul and onwards into the book of Revelation, then there seems to be a kind of a cluster of ideas about what happens to people after they die. And it is a very clear and quite kind of um, obviously stated view that what happens after death is resurrection. The resurrection of the body is the predominantly biblical view of what happens to you after you die. 
And again, just a little footnote. It is endlessly fascinating to me that the popular Christian view of what happens to us after we die is not really biblical. I'm not saying it's unbiblical, but it's not really, it's not right in the centre of the biblical tradition. And it absolutely fascinates me about how that has happened. How have we actually slipped into something which looks, if you want, if you're interested in this, something much more Neoplatonist than actually something from the centrality of the New Testament tradition? It's a fascinating question, which we can talk about later if people are interested. So that the predominant idea of what happens to us after we die is the resurrection of the body. And that fits in to one of the ideas I was just talking about a moment ago, about the idea that heaven will pass away. Of course, if you believe that heaven will pass away, then you don't actually want your ultimate destination to be heaven, because um, you will get the idea that therefore there is no eternal life. Um, you, know, you might, if you go to heaven when you die and then heaven passes away, you're in a bit of a problem there. So what you have, therefore, is resurrection of the body, which fits in with this understanding. Resurrection of the body is resurrection to a new body for the new heaven and the new earth. It will be physical, it will be created, and it will exist in a spatial physical realm, which is the new heaven and the new earth. And that seems to be the predominant view that you find from the New Testament texts. And is, incidentally, that which we say we believe in every time we say the creeds, whichever, whichever one we say. We either say, I believe in the resurrection of the body, or, um, oh, my mind's gone blank, help me out quickly. <laughs> we await the resurrection. We, we look for the resurrection of the dead. There it is, it's come back to me. We look for the resurrection of the dead. But both of which are saying we believe in resurrection, in the resurrection of the body. Finally, let me just say very swiftly to be able to tie all of this up and then I will conclude and will give us time for conversation. If, therefore, um, our ultimate destination is resurrection to a physical body in a physical world newly created by God, the obvious question is, well, what happens between the moment when I die and the moment of resurrection? What happens then? And the answer is, well, the real answer is, who knows? But there is various different answers provided by the biblical narratives. And the problem is, there isn't one answer given. There are a variety of answers given. Some texts seem to imply that you sleep in the dust of the earth. Daniel 12, for example, talks about sleeping in the dust of the earth until resurrection. So that idea, therefore, is that nothing significant happens between your death and resurrection, but that um, sleeping happens and then you are raised. Other possibilities are that you go somewhere to await resurrection. And the language of Sheol, which is translated into the kind of complex Greek word Hades, has that implication where you live a certain shady existence until the moment of resurrection when God will judge for either for eternal life or eternal torment. Or a third possibility is that you go somewhere and that somewhere is a place in which judgment already has taken place on death. Um, think the parable of Dives and Lazarus, if you want to kind of think of an example of that. Dives and Lazarus, Lazarus immediately goes to the bo bosom of Abraham, Dives goes immediately to, to torment. But the implication nevertheless of that is that there will come a moment when they will be raised and they will carry on living the fates that they have experienced on death. The really interesting question um, is where is that? Where do you spend that time? And of course the traditional Christian answer is in the heavenly realms. But just think back to Dives and Lazarus and you'll realise that the tradition is slightly more complex than you might think. Because it says in the parable of Dives and Lazarus that in Hades, Dives saw Lazarus. The implication therefore is not that Dives is down here and Lazarus is up here, the implication is they're in the same place, but they are um, divided by a chasm. Dives is on one side of it, Lazarus is on the other side of it. So perhaps the Dives and Lazarus parable has that um, judgment before um, resurrection, but they're both in Hades. Final strand, just to kind of fill in the picture, is that there are hints that people do, in fact, dwell in the heavenly realms while waiting for resurrection. You get those hints most strongly in the book of Revelation, chapters 6 and 7. 
But what I'm trying to illustrate, therefore, is that actually our very popular understandings of what happened after we die um, are not really borne out by the biblical narratives. So what, therefore, do we do with all of this big tradition? I would say that the most important thing that we do is we talk about it. We need to start our theological conversations about heaven in a much more earnest, and I don't just mean serious, but a much more kind of deliberate way. Because one of the things that I observe within churches in particular is that we wait until somebody has died before we start talking about what we believe about life after death. And the real problem of that is the very last time that you can actually talk in a creative way about what you believe about life after death is when you're bereaved. You just can't do it. Um, and for me, one of the really interesting things is that if we began a conversation more widely within our churches about what we believe about life after death, then actually we would begin, be able to begin to explore these ideas more fully, more thoughtfully, and in a much more creative way. So, heaven. What is heaven about? I would say that heaven is about engaging with a God who yearns to be close to earth. And examples of that can be found all the way through the biblical narrative. And what we need to do as Christians is to learn the language of heaven so that we can begin to talk more creatively, more thoughtfully about it. I'd like to end by reading the final paragraph of my book, which is um, one where I say what I think are really the implications of everything that I've been talking about this morning and, of course, in the rest of the book. So let me just end by reading this final paragraph. A good theology of heaven challenges us to reimagine who we are and what the world might be. Most of all, it summons us into worship of the one who created our world, who summons all living things into being who breathes life deep within us, who hears when we cry out in despair, and who time and time again breaks out of the constraints we place upon him to speak to us. Thinking and speaking of God demands every last iota of imagination that we possess, if we have any hope of expressing anything about who God is. The biblical writers use the language and imagery at their disposal in their description of God and the realm where he dwells. Our challenge is to do the same. Though when all our words, images, and poetry fail, we may find that the most expressive language of all is silence. Which is not a great line upon which to begin a conversation, (laughs) but um, let us do so anyway. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I'm fascinated by the Celtic concept of thin places, um, which you talk about in the book. Um, Sacred places where the division between heaven and earth, as it were, disintegrates, literally becomes thinner. And one of your great challenges in the book is to try to, well, to embrace the conventional concept of thin places, um, quiet places, beautiful churches, um, the ruins of abbeys, walks in the countryside, all of which are valid, but you challenge us also to look for the places where light shines in darkness in very unconventional places like, for example, um, the inner city. So, so the thin places thing works very well in relation to drawing heaven and earth together. Absolutely, because it, I think for me one of the, kind of the really striking things about the biblical tradition is this idea that heaven is so very close to earth. You can't necessarily see it, but it's right there. But there are, of course, some places where you feel that more powerfully than others. And for me, one of the really striking bits of reinterpretation that goes on in the New Testament is a reinterpretation of that glorious bit in Genesis, you know, where Jacob has the vision of the angels ascending and descending. And he um, um, exclaims at the end of that, surely this is the gate of heaven. John 1.51 reinterprets that in a really fascinating way because that's where Jesus talks about the Son of Man and on the Son of Man you see the angels ascending and descending. So what John does is he says it's no longer just a place, it is a person. The person is where you discover therefore the gate of heaven. And so I would say that that gives us a really fascinating challenge to our theology, is that yes, of course there are places which are very thin, places where you can begin to encounter something of heaven breaking into earth, 
But actually, now within the Christian tradition, we believe that the person who brings that is Jesus. Therefore, wherever Jesus is present, that is a thin place. No matter how grim, no matter how awful, every place on earth can potentially be a thin place if the Son of Man is present for the angels to ascend and descend, which for me is a really kind of challenging Mm. thought to explore. Mm. And if we have an experience of Christ as a thin place and we see that disintegration between heaven and earth, we are to tell people the things of heaven, that, that command of telling people, the people of earth, about the things of heaven. So John in Revelation is given the vision specifically so that he can tell the people of earth about the things of heaven. But then there's all that tricky stuff in the Gospel of Mark about Jesus, about revelations that Jesus provides people with, and then his command not to tell anyone. And that's tricky stuff, isn't it? Oh, it is. And, you know, one of the greatest conundrums is what was Jesus thinking in Mark 4 to say, you know, I've come so that no one will understand, everyone will look on, they won't get it. Now, what was he talking about? For me, one of the really interesting things to to do is reading the whole of Mark's gospel. Because for the vast majority of Mark's gospel, you get that Jesus who says, don't tell, don't mention it, which of course has the opposite effect always. I would say always go off and do lots of telling. But there is one moment in Mark's gospel where Jesus says, go tell. Um, And it's in Mark 16, um, when um, the, the women encounter the risen Jesus, and then Jesus says, go tell. And of course, it has the opposite effect. The women run away and say nothing, apparently. But the reason why I think that's really very significant is that all the way through Mark's Gospel, you've got the story of people not getting it. Um, Most importantly, the disciples, who over and over again just don't get what it is that Jesus is. Um, And I would argue that what Jesus is doing is saying, wait till you've got the whole picture. Wait till you've got everything that you need, then go tell. And the moment where they had it all was at the resurrection. Once the resurrection had happened, then they had their thousand-piece jigsaw. Um, before they just had kind of incremental parts of the thousand piece jigsaw. It was at that moment that they could go and tell. And the beautiful irony that I absolutely love about Mark's gospel is that Mark ends with, you know, go tell, and the women didn't tell anyone because they were afraid. But how do we know that they didn't tell anyone? Because we're reading it in Mark's gospel. So we know that they ultimately did tell, because otherwise we wouldn't be reading that they didn't tell. And there's, there's that lovely little kind of parody going on in Mark, which I always cause me great pleasure. Oh, I'm pausing because it's such an important question Um, and requires you to get into um, understandings of bodies, which for me is the really, really interesting thing. Um, The way in which we normally do our understanding of um, life after death is we work on a very Greek understanding of the body, you know, that the physical thing is the outer shell and in in that is the spirit, which... um, exists within the body while you live, and then when you die, the spirit is freed from that, and that is the way in which you engage with God. And I sometimes slightly controversially say, if I got my way, I'd ban the word spirituality. Um, I don't really mean it, but there is a, there's a kind of a point to, to what I say, which is that it goes... I think we need to be very careful about not going too far down the Greek line of the body being the thing that we want to get away from and the spirit being the good thing inside it. So if you look at more Hebrew concepts of the body, then actually the word that you would often translate as soul is the thing that is to be found in the blood. You find it very, very much in Genesis 2 and Genesis 9 that the thing that gives the body life is the nephesh, the nephesh of God. And the nephesh, sometimes translated soul, travels around in the blood, which is incidentally why you eat kosher. Um, You don't eat the blood because that's where the nephesh dwells. And I'm coming at your question kind of round the side, and because I think it's quite a complex question to ask. It therefore then kind of raises all sorts of questions about what is it that is the bit of you that encounters God. In Greek tradition, it's the spirit and not the body. In Hebrew tradition, it is the whole of the body. Nefesh, the lot. And so 
Interestingly, the, the word consciousness is much more of a Greek word than it is a Hebrew word, which is why I'm struggling to answer the question in a way. Because, and, and the other thing we need to be very careful not to do is not to pull the two apart and say that there is no Greek philosophy in Hebrew thinking, because of course there is. But to try and kind of wrestle a little bit more with actually what does it mean to be a being that encounters God. And, and I would say that there is the spiritual bit, which is really very important, but there is that bit within the Hebrew tradition, which is about embodiment. And for me, there is something very important about reinvesting our tradition with embodiment and recognizing that in embodiment, we can encounter God as well as through spirit. Um, and conscious, I haven't really answered your question, but the reason why I haven't done so is that because it's actually quite a difficult question to answer. So what I've done is come round the side at it um, and hope that'll give you something more to think about. Um, and, and your question is utterly spot on in that what it reveals is how we struggle with the biblical tradition. And your two halves of the question kind of thoroughly expo expose the difficulties that we've got which are that um, the Hebrew writers and the writers of the New Testament work very, very clearly with a model of the world that we don't share anymore, which is not of the world as a planet with atmosphere, with galaxies, upon galaxies, upon galaxies. Instead, they saw very clearly, um, and in a way it was, it was about as close to observational science as you could get, really, is that how do I know how the world works? Well, I look that way as far as I can see, and that must be the end that way. And I look that way as far as I can see, and that must be the end that way. And I look upwards and I see blue. Now, what's blue? Oh, water's blue. So therefore, water must be up there. And it's very clear from the Psalms and Isaiah that they did believe that above the sky was water, which is incidentally what happens when it rains. Holes open in the firmament and the water comes through. It is observational science of a certain kind. They see the world in which they live and they draw conclusions from that. What we do now is we are doing observation, observational science of a completely different kind because our observations are now completely different because of the way in which we can do the observations. And that's where you get into this big, big question of how you then begin to unpick all of these things. And, you know, you've got, in a way, you've got a spectrum of views. Right down at that end is um, the Bible has to be right. If it's not, it has to be wrong at one end. At the other end is a recognition that actually what the biblical writers are trying to do is to describe what can't be described using the words that they've got at their disposal. They are trying to describe the world as they observe it, using those words. They're trying to describe who they understand God to be, using the words they have at their disposal. And one of the things that I would argue is that what we have fallen into the trap of doing is using their words when we don't actually share their view of the world. And instead, what we need to do is be very, very considerate and respectful of their words because they are in the Bible, they are the word of God, and yet nevertheless do the act of translation. And for me, I'm passionate about translation, which is that translation of all sorts is interpretation. Um, and we don't, most of us these days, read the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek because we've translated it into words that we can understand. We shouldn't just stop with words, we should also stop begin with the theological ideas that lie behind the words as well. And I would say that the next step of interpretation, of translation, is to translate what they were trying to communicate about the world, its relationship to God, the way in which God relates to us, into language that we can now understand, which is not just English. It's 21st century Western scientifically inspired English, which then becomes a different kind of a task. And I think we've become lazy and just done half the task and not the other half. Um, for me, the really important thing is doing the other half of the task. And here we are in the kingdom season in the liturgy, Indeed, so a very yeah, appropriate right. point. Mm -hmm. And yes, are we, can we be the gateway of heaven and, and the kingdom of... Well, and, and I, I think one of the things that you discover in kind of the biblical narrative is, is the answer to that question is, is half yes and half no. 
Half yes in so much as that reference from Luke talks about the kingdom of heaven is within you, very important strand. Also, all of the Pauline language about those who are baptised are in Christ. And therefore, if we are in Christ, we have a Christ identity. If Christ is the place where the gateway of heaven is to be found, then those of us who are in Christ are the gateway to heaven. So all of that is, is there. But I think I would hesitate. What the, what the biblical writers do is have an enormously rich um, variety of metaphors and variety of language that they use, some of which talks about God in heaven up there, some of which talks about the world, heaven breaking into the world. And I think what we need to do is use all of them, you know, kind of not, not just to kind of retreat into one that makes us feel more comfortable, because that one would make us feel more comfortable, but to re recognise the importance of that, but also to kind of bring the other kind of images into play as well. But can I just respond very quickly about the kingdom mm. stuff as well, which I think is quite an interesting... It is worth bearing in mind that it's only Matthew that talks about the kingdom of heaven. Um, Mark and Luke and John talk about the kingdom of God. Paul, fascin fascinatingly, hardly ever mentions the kingdom of God. Three times does Paul mention the kingdom of God, which makes you go, why not? You know, where did it go to, the phrase, from the gospel tradition into the Pauline tradition? Um, and and one of the very in, one of the kind of very good reasons I didn't talk about the kingdom of God is I'm yet to find a New Testament scholar who can say hand on heart they really know what it is. Um, the kingdom of God is kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is almost impossible to describe, which is why I think Jesus most often says the kingdom of God is like the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, leaven, pearls, treasure. You name it, it is like that. Because Jesus doesn't actually say the kingdom of heaven is, only it's like this, it's like that, it's like the other. The idea being that we're meant to wrestle in this kingdom season. A really good thing to do is to begin to reflect more deeply on, on actually what did Jesus mean by the kingdom of heaven is like. Um, and consequently, there is one thing that we can be sure of, and the rest then we need to work on, that the kingdom of heaven is most certainly breaking in. Um, the rest, I think, is slightly up for grabs. And one might want to say that some of his domestic metaphors allow those thin places to be um, yes. uh, experienced by us in our uh, very, perhaps, domestic uh, lives and, Absolutely. and, and worlds. Absolutely. Yes, that's right. Yes. Huge, thank you, a huge question, a huge um, implication. Um, and in a way, what it does is it turns on its head a lot of attitudes to the world that have been predominant throughout the Christian tradition. Because influenced by the Neoplatonism I talked about and other elements of Greek philosophy, it won't come as a surprise to any of us to realise that we've become rather anti-physical. Um, the created world is something we should kind of yearn to get away from. Our bodies are something which are bad and bring evil into the world, therefore we desire to get away from them as quickly as possible, and, 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 we know the way in which the tradition works. Actually, if you reinvest an understanding of heaven as a physical place, with the resurrection of our bodies being physical in the world to come, that eternity is going to be a physical existence rather than a spiritual existence, then a very simple but very important kind of correlation comes out of that, which is we need to start be better at being physical now. Because if we don't learn to be good at being physical, we're rather stuffed for eternity. Because we've got to do it for the rest of our lives, you know, for the rest of our lives in eternity. And so there is some really important implications, I think, about the environment, how we live in the planet, how we treat our bodies, what we think about our bodies. And that's why I have a thing about the word spirituality is that the word spirituality still implies that the best thing that you do when you encounter God is you do it without your body. And what I want to try and find is a word that can be something like embodied spirituality or something like that, which is about recognising that we encounter God in the bodies we've got now because we will do so even more once we are raised from the dead. And there's something for me really very important about actually, therefore, how we live, the decisions we make, our spiritual decisions um, about the things that we do to our bodies as much as about our prayer life, which kind of shifts things around a lot. So thank you for the question. And of course, fear of the body has skewed so much of our church debate in, in recent years mm. and in the mid 20th century, particularly in Anglicanism, there was a great celebration of incarnation and the relationship between body and spirit. Um, people have referred to the incarnational bent of Anglicanism.
uh, mm. particularly in things like the creative arts, mm. and yet we've now become so afraid of the body, and our, mm. our church, our theology, and our church debates have become yeah, absolutely. Skewed. Yes, that's right. What, one of the, the, the really interesting things is that kingdom language is so interesting um, because, again, what it does is it comes from a world which is light years away from our own because it comes from a world in which the only way in which um, government took place, in which kind of nations functioned, was with kings. Um, and kings, of course, live in kingdoms. And therefore, that language, um, and it's very clear from the biblical narrative that the, the biblical writers have taken the metaphor of God as king and made that the major metaphor because that's how they viewed the world. Another point that I make in the book is I think we are facing a really intrigue. The other problem we've got, which is lesser but nevertheless quite challenging, is that we live in a democracy, not in a kingdom so much, you know, it's, it's disputable and negotiable, but, but actually most of us would recognise democracy more than kingdom language. And therefore we have another layer of problems of understanding this language, which is the stuff that we don't really recognise kingdom language in the same kind of way. And so I like your rephrasing of it, your translation of it as the place where God rules supreme or where the principles of God can be found to be lived out. And um, that, as you say, can happen spatially, can happen in particular places, it can happen in particular groups of people, it can happen in individuals. But I think it, it is worth saying that um, there is no evidence anywhere within the Gospels that there is an expectation that there is a perfect overlap between the kingdom of God and the church. Um, in fact, well, let me say it the other way, it is quite clear that there is not a perfect overlap between the kingdom of God and the church, which is... And I think that's one of the things that the church needs constantly to be reminded of. Yeah, that's right. And, and part of our job, I think, as Christians is to become recognisers of thin places, thin places and places where that exists in people, so that we can say these are the markers of the places where heaven breaks into earth. And then we can become really good at recognising them in the world where they exist. You know, and sometimes that will be within our churches, and sometimes, often, it will be not in our churches. And that, I think, will be something very important to recognise. Yes, um, Paula, I didn't catch that. Maybe you did. Could you...? Yes, um, the, it's the Robert Browning poem you were talking about, and, um, and the reference to um, heaven in Robert Browning. And the question is, is, was he a religious man? To which, I must admit, I don't know the answer. Um, does anybody else know the answer? Um, all I can do is, from my knowledge of his poetry, say that I resonate very deeply with the language that he uses, with the ideas that he has of, um, of heaven and of, the rela of, of earth and of relationships with human beings. So I would say he is most definitely, to use the word I don't really like, a spiritual man. Whether he's a religious man is up for grabs. Um, but I cannot for the life of me tell you whether he would have liked my book, but I can tell you that as somebody who is passionate about heaven, I love his poetry. And because there is something about that resonance, he communicates in beautiful language the kind of stuff that I think I'm trying to talk about in my book. So and, and Paula, in happens. your book, you, you, you hold William Blake up, don't I do. you, as the epitome? Oh, yes. And William Blake is the most remarkable writer in this, writer and artist, is that Blake loves Revelation. And having read Revelation and kind of got it in every fibre of his body, he then writes his poetry and paints his pictures. And if you can't quite get to grips with Revelation, having a go, have a go getting to grips with Blake. It can be a lot easier, um, not least with the paintings. My little argument about Revelation, which the, I had one of those kind of blinding flashes where I suddenly understood Revelation better than I'd ever done, when I realised that actually Revelation is an art gallery, it's not a book. If you think within the Jewish tradition you can't paint, Jewish apocalyptic became the artwork of the Jewish world, in that you can't paint it, but you can paint word pictures. And if you try seeing Revelation in your mind's eye, rather than trying to write down the list of everything that it's trying to tell you, it suddenly makes a lot more sense. And I think Blake knew that, which is why he painted in the way that he did. Well, Paula, I, I'm the presenter here, so I have as my brief the, the liturgy and the worship and the music. And uh, you talk about worship as being, of course, uh, a, a thin place, a gateway opportunity. And you say a very interesting thing about it's not how we worship so much as what we think we're doing when we worship, which I think is a very good challenge. Mm.
Yes, I mean, because so often it's very easy within, um, well, even in individual congregations, let alone in the church at large, to talk all the time about, should we do it like this or should we do it like that? Um, and it seems to me that actually how you do it is of totally relevance, really, to the biblical writers. But what you do get, and I think you get it very clearly in Revelation, which I find very inspiring, is the idea that when you worship, you are joining the angels in heaven before God's throne. And so actually the question of whether you're doing it right or not is not about what century your music comes from or whether you're using a, words on a page or not words on a page. The idea more is, can people who have joined in with that worship resonate with the idea that they've accompanied the angels in their worship? And then you'll know whether you've got it right or not. And you mentioned before Advent and Christmas hymns providing us with lots of opportunities that we then miss. And mm. my favourite Christmas hymn is It Came Upon the Midnight yes. Clear, yes, yes, yes. where you have that beautiful line that almost epitomises what mm. you've been saying about uh, from heaven bending near the earth to hear mm. the angels sing. So, Paula, thank you so much for a fascinating um, uh, uh, articulation of your book, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading, and I hope uh, other people have done or will do. Um, we're so glad that you've given us your time and that you've been with us. Uh, all this talk of thin places has reminded me about my diet. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know whether that'll be another opportunity to encounter heaven, probably not. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, ne uh, the, um, Paul is staying on now to um, sign copies of the book if people would like to purchase them. I want to thank Elizabeth Foy for organising all of this and Rob Gordon for filming it. And uh, but particularly a big round of applause for Paula for being with us today.